I'm going to read one verse from that reading that Polly was talking about in the children's message. And the word became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the, of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Lord, direct our hearts and minds upon you. We thank you for the word who became flesh, our Lord Jesus. Thank you for this new year before us. Send your Holy Spirit to help us that we might know your love for us and how we might follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a, a boy, I looked forward to Christmas like no other season. Not all of you perhaps had happy Christmas memories, but mine were very happy. And as I was thinking about it, why was it such a happy season for me? Well, family was all together, that's for sure. And I appreciated the gifts that uh, uh, I eventually realized were not coming from Santa, but from my sacrificing parents. But I think there's also something else about this season. Something that Charles Dickens mentions in The Christmas Carol, that great classic. He says, this is the time of year when hearts are more open and more kind and more loving than any other season. Why is that? I believe it's because at that season, at that time, we realize that God truly loves us. Sometimes we forget that. And the writer John here starts out, he starts to write, and it's a little bit hard to understand what he's talking about. Like a God who's sort of theological or something. Let me help you out here. He says, the word became flesh. What is the word, all right? In Greek, that is the logos, from which we get our word, word logical. Logos can be can mean reason, it can mean, um, it can mean life force. That's how the Greeks thought of this thing called logos. It wasn't exactly a god, it was more like a force that controlled the universe in Greek thought. John borrows this word and says, I'm going to use this word to describe the second person of the Trinity. Do you know that for a long, long time, there was no Jesus. There was the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And he shows up all over the place in the Old Testament Scriptures, but there's no Jesus. There's no Jesus until his birthday on earth. But he always existed as part of the Trinity. And this, this word that John talks about, was with God, the Word was God, and He created all things. If you look at Genesis 1, at this familiar account of the creation of the world, there is God and the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Well, there's the first person of the Trinity and the third person of the Trinity. Where's the second person? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. He is the Word. A Word that is active and moving. Words have tremendous, tremendous import. I remember growing up, and I had a, an uncle who was a joker. He liked to make a lot of jokes. Not just puns, by the way. But he told a lot of jokes. 
I was just with my cousin, his oldest son, and he and I were laughing over some of the jokes. But sometimes my uncle could joke a little too much. Some of his jokes were a little mean. He began to call me Kuschwanz. Anybody know what Kuschwanz means? No German speakers? It means cow's tail. (laughs) Because once I was late for something, and so he began to tease me and tease me and tease me about this. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I remember being, becoming more and more angry about this as he teased me over a period of time. And I remember that I had a little wooden hammer. You know the set where you pound the pegs down? You know that, that, that toy? And I remember that that little wooden hammer made quite a hole in the window when I threw it at my uncle. And my mother said, you need to punish Stephen. And I remember my father, I overheard them, and he said, I will give him a little punishment, but not too much, because Leonard should not have called him Kushwans. You see, words have very, very strong meaning. And when God speaks a word, things happen. Good things happen. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be seas, and there were seas. Let there be land, and there was land. Let there be vegetation, and there was vegetation. Let there be animals, and there were animals. Let there be man and woman, and there was human beings. This is the second person of the Trinity at work with the Father and the Spirit in this beautiful harmony creating. And now here's the astounding thing. This word became one of us. He put on flesh. Now, what was the point of this? Well, this is how it worked. God had tried reaching out to his people, being among a special family of Abraham called Israel and using them as a witness for the world. But he realized, he knew, that he was going to have to do something far more drastic than that. The Israelites had a tabernacle in the wilderness and then later the temple where the presence of God dwelt. And God said, we're going to have to do something far far harder. You're going to have to go, son, and become flesh and dwell among these people. The word here where it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, the word is tabernacled in the original language. He came and made his presence, his dwelling among us. He put on flesh, as Paulie said in the children's message, what a sacrifice. This is the king who became the pauper. This is the one who knew no sin to come and have the sin of the world dumped on him. This is the creator of the universe who now is born in a barn. This is amazing love. And to that invasion of our our world by God himself, we saw three responses. And John talks about these three responses. Okay? The first response is they do not recognize him. They do not recognize him. After all, they weren't looking for a baby in a manger. They were looking for a Messiah, an anointed one, who would come and solve all their earthly problems, who would make them prosperous. And by the way, there are many preachers who preach that kind of of language. You know, if you, if you follow Jesus and you do what is right, then God's going to give you all this good stuff. You get that Cadillac you've been praying for. 
right? You've heard the prosperity gospel preachers. But this is not the kind of God that we have, and it's not how he came. He came and made his dwelling among us. He became one of us. In a most unlikely family, poor, unknown. And because people were not looking for that kind of a God come to them, they did not recognize him. They didn't understand who he was. Now, you would have thought that these people, Israel, whom God had dwelt among, they would recognize him, right? They would see him for who he is, the Messiah, and they would accept him. But his own people, they do not receive him. They do not receive him. It's as if the light came into the world and they didn't want the light. And so they pushed him away. They wanted to extinguish him. In the story of the Christmas Carol, you remember the plot. Ebenezer Scrooge is a terrible miser. His God is money. And he is vo- visited by several spirits. And the first one is the ghost of Christmas past. And it shows him his past, and it's very, very difficult for him. It hurts to see himself. And the, and, and the ghost is, is bringing all this up to bring Scrooge to repentance, to change his life. But it gets so painful that he grabs the, the cap that this ghost is, is wearing and pushes it down over the head of the ghost until he extinguishes the ghost. That's what his own people did to Jesus. When he proclaimed himself the Son of God and the Messiah, who had come to save them from their sins, when he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey on Palm Sunday, when he cleared the temple and said, let this be a house of prayer, the religious leaders got together and said, we got to get rid of him. we got to put out the light. This light hurts our eyes. This bothers us. John here says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. But there are many who will not receive that light because it shines into our our hearts and shows us our sin. And it tells us that, that we need a Savior and that we need to give up our lives to follow him instead of trying to run our own life. And that's not popular. If there's one thing that that is common among all people is that everybody wants to run their own life. Now, some people also want to run other people's lives, but that's another story, okay? But we all want to run our own life. If you listen to advertising, you'll see this. You've got this. Do your own thing. Be all that you can be. I remember standing before a a high school senior class and getting to speak to them and saying, tomorrow night is graduation, and a whole lot of people are going to tell you to be everything you can be and grab for all the gusto and whatever other phrases they use. And I said, I want to suggest to you a different way a way of humbleness, and a way of sacrifice, and a way of service. And I guarantee that when you're 55 years old, you'll be a lot more thankful for your life than if it's all about you. You see, Jesus called people to a hard place. If you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. If you want to be one of mine, you have to confess that you're a sinner. 
You have to take the beams out of your own eye before you go poking around in the specks of your brother's eye. And he said many, many similar things like that, and so people did not want him, just as they didn't want the prophets before him who spoke a hard word. But some did receive him, and some still receive him. There were those fishermen and that tax collector. There was the woman whom he cast out seven demons. They were not the religious elite. They were not the intelligentsia. They were not the rich for the most part. But they received him. And those who received him and believed in him as the Son of God, as the Savior. John tells us that they received of him these things. First of all, they have the right to become sons of God. Now, why does it say they have the right to become sons of God? Why doesn't it say sons and daughters, right? God's after everybody. He, you know, he wants all of us in the family. The reason is, is because at that time, only sons got the inheritance. So, everybody, man, woman, child, young, old, beautiful or ugly, rich or poor, they have the, the right to become heirs of the kingdom. What kind of inheritance do they receive? Many of you over these last five years I've been with you have talked to me about dealing with inheritances, often a, a very messy sort of situation, right? Yeah. It's a wonderful family that is able to do this well with each other. Because often children feel like somehow they didn't get enough love, they didn't get enough something, and they become grumpy and possessive and selfish in the inheritance process. But the inheritance here is not about the grand piano or the pool table or who gets the dining room set. It's not about land or houses. It's not about cash or stocks. No, the inheritance that we receive is far more precious. Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. This is the inheritance that you and I have been given. If we are humble before him and say, Lord, I am a sinner and I need you to save me. We get the right of inheritance, of eternity with God. John says it another way. He says, they are born again. The Gospel of John likes to use this phrase, to be born again. And he, and he makes it really clear, this is not a physical birth. This is not a, a, a birth of a physical kind of of offspring. This is a birth that comes by water and the Spirit. You can read more about that in John 3, if you wish. That when we are baptized into Christ's name, when we believe on Him, we are given the assurance that we are His children, born to a new and living hope, redeemed by Christ the crucified. And further, he says, for those who receive him, for those who believe in him, they see the Father and understand him. You see, when God is away out there, it's hard to understand how much he loves us. But when we see God become man nailed on a cross, now it becomes real. Just like for all of us. 
a phone call is great. Right now, my, my wife is on a, a, a cruise with her sisters. Uh, this is a, not just a pleasure cruise, it's one year after my brother-in-law was murdered. And our, my sister-in-law, Becky, requested the family get together, so they decided to do this. And there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for, for getting grief out and healing in that time. And no matter how much Margaret might phone or text or email, it's just not the same as being there and putting her arms around Becky and giving her a hug. We all know that, right? When people say, I'll be with you in spirit, spirit is sort of uh, intangible. I need some flesh and blood. I need God with skin on him, is the way one speaker put it. And so God became a man. God took on flesh. And he made his dwelling among us. And we understand the Father because of Jesus. We understand his mercy. We understand his his love for us in a very tangible way. God was willing to sacrifice anything, even his own son, to bring that about. That we might have relationship with him. We understand him. We say, aha. Aha. The biblical writers said, we speak of that which we have seen and we have heard and we have touched and we have felt. That's as tangible as it gets. I think Jesus gave hugs. I think he gave a lot of hugs. He took every chance that he had to touch people, literally touch people to speak into their lives, to pray over them. And so, in Him, we see the Father's love. And lastly, John says, they receive grace and truth in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, let me explain truth and grace. They're very balanced. Sometimes we call it law and gospel. Truth is, We are sinners. We were made by God, but we rebelled against Him. We've pushed against Him. And grace is, and Jesus Christ came to save those who are sinners. In Jesus Christ, we see truth and we see grace. This is a season when life is very real. And memories are poignant, and it's so hard when people are not there. When there is the empty chair around the Christmas tree. When family is far away. When your sons or your daughters are not with you. God knew that. He knew the loneliness of our hearts. He knew the pain of sin and separation. And so he came into this world and became our Emmanuel, God with us. And so our prayer today is very simple. And it just goes like this. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world. Let's say that together. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world. He didn't have to do that. But he did. His love come down to us, full of grace and truth, that we might be sons and daughters of his. Amen.